Greetings, welcome, and how are you this evening? It's a wonderful early summer evening, and tonight is what I call the beginning of the monsoon season, apparently. Uh, we had uh, enough clouds and a little bit of moisture that I realized we, uh, we are upon the monsoon season up here in northern Arizona in the mountains, uh, as well as we are going to finish Philemon verse 21 tonight. And uh, next we get a surprise interjection on account of a big word. Karistesomai. And that's actually uh, karitsomai would have a zeta there instead of a sigma. And you'll see what that means when we get to it. But uh, again, it's part of the fun and it is a bit of a surprise. So um, I am going to continue where we left off last week after our usual preliminaries. And tonight I start with one of the preliminaries that I also always like to mention, among other things also, that if you're kind of new here, expect not to understand some of this. If you don't, that's okay. Stick with it. Please stick with it. We are a spiritual, theological, exegetical, biblical, and supernatural um, broadcast as opposed to and believe me, it's supernatural that it's happening, as opposed to a religious one. And this board of mine says, grace and the gospel are good news. Religion is not good news. True or pure Christianity is not a religion. And if you think Christianity is a religion, then hear me out. There's Leonard. Ah, greetings. Yeah, actually, uh, I didn't notice um, just now that you came on. So <laughs> I can't keep up with all the details, but I try to keep up with at least the uh, important stuff, right? And you must have been uh, keeping busy yourself. But anyway, welcome. And here's the deal. Tonight, as it says, oh, and I guess I can pop the hello on there um, from Leonard. Always nice to say uh, the good evening part. The other one doesn't matter so much. <laughs> ah, a busy day it was. Very cool. Yeah, um, I'd say it's pretty much the same here. And if you catch the replay at the beginning, you'll see you only missed a minute or two or whatever. I started my usual time. It says 7.30 when I say I'm going to start it somewhere, but I always start it around 7.35. And uh, yeah, it's um, I'm calling it the first official day of monsoon season. Because as far as I'm concerned, and I took a little video of it here. I'll share that with everybody. Oh, I see. I have a post from um, all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil, from a dear uh, sweetheart down there named Paula. And uh, uh, very nice. Oh, by the way, it says winter arrived in Brazil on June 20th. Very cold around here. <laughs> So, oh, that's funny. Yeah, I like the, uh, look, notice the yawn at the bottom there. A good night and a yawn. So that just came up a couple minutes ago as well. Um, oh, yeah, what I was going to show you before I got distracted. See, there's many uh, good distractions. Oh, there, got to have that in there. Uh, you know what I'll do? Let me see if I can get a picture of that for her. <laughs> uh you know, we, we they can't possibly pay us enough to be miserable, so we're going to have a good time anyway. There's the hello. Hello, Brazil. Did I get it in focus? Trying to see if it's in focus enough. Hey, why is it not? Um, there we go. Couldn't expand it. <laughs> Look, Leonard, a hello, Brazil. I'm going to send that to her tomorrow because she obviously went to sleep. There's the, the big the big picture. And she has watched, by the way, on Periscope broadcasts. But right now they're four hours ahead. 
And so she is going to bed and that rhymes. <laughs> so um, I wanted to show you, um, this is a 21 second blurb. We started at the beginning and I have the sound off, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, check out this, uh, this shot. Oh, I man, I gotta get it at the beginning. Hold on, let me pause it. Cause I want you to see the water. There are the drops on the patio. And from that moment on, it goes real quick. Uh, let's see, there we go. All right, it's very dry out there. And, but look at the moisture in the air. Oh yeah, Leonard's halfway in between on the time zones. And you can see there's quite a bit of uh, stormy clouds in the area. And it's only going to become more so that way as the monsoon season kicks in around here. And I am happy for it. Uh, it's a good thing. And we need the water. I don't know if we're going to get very much. And I don't know about you guys. Here's uh, Leonard's comment about the four-hour difference being halfway in between. All right. So as usual, we try to be serious and have a good time anyway. Like they say, I don't know who they are, the infamous they. The infamous they say they can't possibly pay us enough to be miserable. So we're going to have a good time anyway. And that's my slogan in general. Ah, comment. And yes, uh, rain is needed. And I know you had some the other day, uh, which is a good thing over there in the Tennessee area. Uh, Leonard mentioned it the other day. Uh, what else? What else? All right. So uh, we have a surprise interjection tonight when we get into it. So what I'll do to try to go quickly on this introductory stuff that I always mention, um, and I'm just going to say it this way. You know, this is a theological, exegetical, biblical, supernatural, um, biblical, let's see, what did I say? Biblical, exegetical, uh, supernatural, theological, and uh, I keep missing one because uh, there's five of them. But anyway, uh, broadcast. What is it? exegetical, biblical, theological, supernatural, and man, every time I say that, I'm missing one. It's my night for missing one, I guess. Look, rather than take all this time again on all this nonsense, here's a board that really matters. Why? Because if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are indwelt by the God of the universe, the triunity, a triune God, a trinity, if you will, Father, Son, and Spirit, you know, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. All that, it's that. And the reason this board is so important is because if you're not a believer in Christ and you don't know who he is, now you can say, well, I'll just accept it. I'll take it as a biblical fact because it does say it all over the Bible that there would be a Mashiach or a Christ, a Christos. And when you place your faith in Christ, the guy who went to the cross and died for the sins of the world, as per John 3.16 and 3.36 and Ephesians 2.8 and 9 and Acts 16.31 and a whole bunch of other verses, it's, it's all Bible stuff. And if people know it, they go, oh, yeah, I know those verses. If they don't know it, then I'm telling you. That's the problem. People say, oh, I don't believe that crap. I go, crap? Actually, you don't believe in something that you don't understand and don't know about. You can call that crap if you want, or you can call it ignorance. But whatever you call it, it's there. It's a fact. And if you believe... What the Bible says, that's where you start. You got to start somewhere. I mean, you believe the teacher when they taught you that the numbers start at zero and go one, two, three, dot, 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 you know, nine. And then guess what? You run out of numbers. Did you notice that? Because 10 is a one and a zero. So I already used those. And 11 is two ones and so on and so forth. So if you know that in the beginning, you have to trust 
and you have to have faith. That's why um, this ministry called RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries provided a doctrinal Bible studies catalog. And right there, I'm going to post the contact info so that you can connect with them if you want to. There's P.O. Box, there's phone number, there's website. Notice the name theme is T-H-I-E-M-E. -E. There's an I in there, just so that you remember. And so that you get it right. And see rbtheme.org. And there's also a church uh, associated with that ministry, and that's Baraka or Baraha. If, if you say it the Hebrew way, and up near the top here, let's see, where does it say Baraka Church? Um, there, near the bottom, uh, four lines up, of Baraka Church in Houston, B-E-R-A-C-H-A-H. -A -H. If you go up to Baraka.org, B-E-R-A-C-H-A-H, Baraka in Hebrew, um, you can find out more about that ministry. There's also another ministry called Grace Doctrine Church. And that's a good one too um, for getting biblical information. Let me see if I can give you their information very quickly based on previous um, searches. I'm going to see how far this goes and see if it comes up early on because it was a long time ago when I first started going there. I mean, first started uh, looking it up in my phone here, but I guess I got rid of it. You know how you try to get rid of some of your old stuff? So it's not in the beginning anymore. Uh, here's the one for the home of Baraka Church. I might as well show you that one. Um, there's, uh, see, Baraka.org. That will get you to Baraka Church. Then uh, the one that I'm looking for, it probably would, would have been at this point easier to just type it. Here's Grace Doctrine Church. And look, it says, uh, well, you can't quite see the, the J there. Why is that? Oh, because it's too long. It's, or the G. The first letter is a G, gdconline.org. And what they're showing you there is, yeah, you can't quite see the whole address. But uh, take my word for it. It's a G at the beginning, gdconline.org. And they also have all of their, um, they, they also have class notes and in PDF form. They have um, uh, diagrams. They're all botched up here on the, on the phone. Uh, recent classes, which includes tonight. There was one earlier starting uh, James chapter four. And all of this is very important. Oh, also uh, Leonard is mentioning that, and I think he meant uh, Baraka Church, but both of them, Baraka and um, uh, Grace Doctrine Church have apps. You know, everybody's up to date on the internet stuff. And uh, I'm the one that occasionally uh, goofs things up because I'm not used to everything. Um, I'm always learning, though. Let me, uh, I did take a couple of drops of my allergy stuff just before starting the class. But I haven't taken any all day. Uh, I, I should say, and I've lowered my intake of um, dehist down to one pill at breakfast and one at dinner. And I haven't had dinner yet, so is it in there? Or did I put them at breakfast and lunch? Yeah, it's not there. In case you're wondering, that's what some of my supplements look like. This is my dinner batch. Um, I take lots of wonderful things so that I never get sick. I don't get colds, flus, sore throats, COVID, stuff like that, if I get enough sleep, get some exercise, get some good nutrition, and let's see, what's the other one? Well, take my supplements. And so I can 
strongly recommend that to you. But I am getting so far off track from getting back to normal timing instead of ahead of time uh, and make everything quick. So it's easy for me to get sidetracked and digress. And anybody who knows me well uh, can attest to that. Um, any of you that have been watching for a long time, you know, I get off on tangents and uh, like I said, they can't possibly pay us enough to be miserable. So we're going to have a good time anyway, but we do get a lot done. Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, the Bible, uh, the doctrinal Bible studies catalog and the books that we use and 11,000 hours of before they had the internet and eventually even after the internet was created and became commonplace. The Colonel RB Team Junior, that RB Team Junior Bible Ministries, and um, rbtheme.org, all of that, all of this stuff was being disseminated, sent out to everybody. Why? Because actually, God wants us to have all this information, and you're going to see tonight after we have our uh, opening prayer. Some interesting stuff, including our surprise interjection of Kari Stace. Let's see, how do I pronounce that? Kari Stace I was on the right track. So again, uh, all of you who know what this chart means, we're going to have silent prayer so that you can make sure that you are in fellowship. And secondly, for anybody who does not have a relationship with the God of the universe by faith alone and Christ alone, it's as easy as believe in or on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, okay? So, um, and that has something to do with this Kari Stesomai word in a certain kind of way, and you will see some of that shortly. Meanwhile, we need to take a moment now for silent prayer to clear the decks, make sure that we are in fellowship and filled with the Spirit. Sorry, I'm not explaining all this other stuff, but you can watch that on previous uh Broadcast, which on YouTube, they are available. If you just look up my name, Philippe Willems, here I'll do a uh, shameless plug. Um, there's my name, my spelling. See, uh, where is it? Way over here. Philippe Willems, uh, P H I L I P P E, and then Willems, W I L L E M S. And uh, this is just a graphic showing this little. Uh, CD. I guess I could have done it much bigger by doing that, but there's always reflections and all this nonsense. Let me see if I can get that without reflection. Anyway, there's my spelling and my mug, but I'm playing my six string bass on the cover of the, uh, the CD there. And I'm really a guitar player, but I play everything else because I have to. That's just the way it works these days. If you can't play everything and can't produce yourself and can't make your own records, and all that, you're in trouble because you can't get anybody else to do it. Either that or you got to pay them a lot of money. See, like this here, I'm, that's my classical guitar. Made it on the back of the record. Didn't make it on any of the songs. But there's 12 songs. And again, you can get a hold of me on YouTube. Um, if you look up Facts and Music, you'll have a problem. If you put Philippe Willems in Facts and Music, you'll find me. But Facts and Music has been hijacked. I was hacked by the Russians. And... Um, but if you go on YouTube, you'll find all of the previous um, broadcasts, including the oldest one on there, is where I'm playing for four minutes and 10 seconds. And I play parts of five songs in four minutes. So there. All right. <clears throat> Without further ado, let's prepare uh, once again to study the things that we're going to see tonight. Um, and so without further ado, as I always say, say it again, uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we thank you for the privilege of having a relationship with you and approaching you, uh, approaching your throne of grace. And by the, the permission that we have from you, uh, as it, for people who are not a believer to come to you and place their faith in Christ, and for those of us who are believers to come to you and ask to make sure that we are filled with the Spirit, that we can. Uh, discern spiritual issues, spiritual phenomena, and that we can actually go to the depths that your word provides of your truth, capital T. 
And so uh, we thank you now for the time we're going to spend together and the things we're going to look at. Please sanctify these things to the nourishment of our souls. We always ask this, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name, amen. And voila, we are back in the saddle and ready to go. And tonight I have a whole bunch of um, stuff to get through, the, the notes that are pertinent, that help us to understand this particular verse that we've been in. And tonight we'll be looking at a couple of books. One of them that I know at least one person watching has is this uh, inner linear New Testament in Greek and English. And we are in this verse 21 down here. Uh, what's neat about this book is it shows the Greek words and the English underneath it. And so we're going to finish, uh, what's the word, in earnest. Uh, so technically, we will be finished with verse 21. And we're going to see something about verse 22, I think. <laughs> so we have to try to get there. So let us begin. Yeah, there you go. Leonard's got a copy of it. <laughs> and uh, in verse 21... You'll see we're going to finish the couple of words. And then if you go to the next page, um, the very, well, the second to last word, it's the very first word on the third line, page 747. Uh, it says chapter one, verse 22, but technically there is no one. It's just verse 22. Um, to be technical. Uh, the word there is the word that I wrote on the board, which, thank goodness, it reminds me to take that off. Karistesomai. And so I'm hoping that we actually, we're not going to necessarily get to that word. It's it's not because of that word that, or I should say because of that verse that we're on that word. Uh, that word is at the end of verse 22. Isn't that funny how sometimes you start at the end? So we will see. Oh, I, I, I leave the, whatever you call this. What is this thing called? Viewer comments up. <laughs> That's easy enough. All right. So anyway, <coughs> we have been looking at verse 21. We will technically finish it. Let's read it uh, in this new Greek English interlinear New Testament on page 746. Six, it reads this way on the side the the you know i guess i should show it this way see on the side there is the, that english stuff i'm going to read right there near where the arrow is of course that arrow is at verse 19 so go down to verse 21 it says confident of your obedience i am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than what i say all right, we've done a lot of study on that verse. We've been there for a very long time. And we actually, in earnest, finished it tonight. Last week, we were looking at a few of the words, like about the word there, I am convinced or persuaded. And, and then it said, I write to you, uh, grapho su, those would be the two words, the regular forms um it actually says i wrote to you a grapsa soy and it can also be translated i am writing to you and then it has a weird word eidos e-i-d-o-s and that o is an uh, omega looks like a w in case you have the text or are reading a greek text and um and that's the form that we had of the word uh, I write to you. And in a way we saw that that had to do with the idea of that the writing is not only writing as in, you know, with your hand, but uh, the idea of the scriptures. I am writing to you, I am writing scripture and it's directed at you and you get to read it and then the rest of the world forevermore will see it. That's pretty amazing. So it refers to the epistle of Philemon. I write to you this epistle, but this is a part of the hey grafe, 
uh, as in Greek, where we have a technical term that means the writings, and it really means the scriptures. Well, that is a little bit of extra theology that you may or may not get in a church. In fact, most churches don't get into a lot of details. Now, we stop there, and I'm going to continue now uh, with the explanation of this word knowing, because it's a weird word. It's not the usual word. The usual word to know in Greek is gnosko, and that word is uh, gnosis is one of the words we get from it. And notice there's a change in the sound and spelling. Um, what I'll do is, let me see if I want to write it on the big board. Yeah, I guess I'll show you. This is part of exegesis. We don't do a lot of this all of the time, but we do it once in a while. And this is a good thing to be checking out. Now, in Greek, the regular word in Koine Greek would be this word. Gnosko. And if I remember correctly, it's two omegas. Yeah, should be because when you get when you get this form, that's why I say it's got another uh, omega right there. Gnosis. Notice this is an internal sigma, and this is a final sigma. And so, uh, gnosko and gnosis. Those are accent marks. And this is the way it would look when you see it in Greek. And if I put underneath it G I N long O S K long O, that's gnosko. And then this would be, and here's where you start to see changes G N. See, there's no gin, it's n. And watch this. Long O S I S. Again, an internal sigma versus a uh, final sigma. Um, this means to know, and this means knowledge. So one is verb form, and another one is in a noun form oops get shoot get that right yet all right so the reason we're looking at this notice the change in form gnosko and gnosis notice this gn business and the gin business change in orthography so the spelling business. Now, here we have the verbal form of to know, and here we have a noun form and a substantival form. And here is something to notice. The GN becomes a KN. That G is the third letter of the alphabet. The alphabet goes alpha, beta, Gamma, then you get, uh, I, I can keep going with delta. See if I give you a, a D that way. There's different ways to write the D. Like, for example, you could do it this way. Um, which, you know, kind of has where we end up getting this look. That is a, a different setup. But, um, be that as it may, let me make sure I'm doing that right. Let's go to Summers since we're going to go to that book uh, shortly anyway. Because I may be confusing the matter with Hebrew, which can happen. Where's my alphabet? Well, I didn't. Um, I didn't confuse it. I got it right. All right. Here's the deal. But there's a reason I could have gotten it wrong. See, there's that one form, and there's the other one. And that one is, a, is a, oh, there, oh, I know, I'm sorry, I did, I did get it wrong. The gamma is, that's a capital G. That's why I said it wrong. It's this one. It's a, there's that D and that D. Knew I needed to look at the book. It's been a while. 
Let me fix that. Let me show you. Well, actually, I didn't do anything wrong here. I did it wrong there. There we go. Knew I did it wrong somewhere. That's why I check. Got to double check this stuff, right? Can't be wrong. Alpha, beta, gamma, and sometimes it'll almost look like an A. I'll have little tails on it down there at the bottom. But that's the capital D. And then the other D, let me see if I can. Yeah, I, I wrote it. It kind of looks like almost an S with a curve. But. You can see it in English letters. And let me, if I can, I'm going to see if I can put this up here or if it's going to cause trouble, uh, show it to you again so that you see this well. Get that right. There you go. There's that triangle looking thing and that little tiny let me get that even bigger i should have taken a picture of this i didn't know i was going to go here to that d that's a delta and that's just I, i'm getting carried away on alphabet letters but what i wanted you to see was that the the third letter that g letter which can look like that, that's the one that we had in the D spot. Um, when you put a G and an N, and see, that's why I write it that way, um, together, sometimes that G is going to turn into a K because it's a hard sound. Gnosis, gnosko. Okay. Um, and there are other times with other letters where, uh, well, the point is that third letter, which is A, B, G, funny enough, A, B, C is related to it. Now, it could have been Kenosko and Kenosis because, look, we get Kenology and Kano out of it. And think about how sometimes K's, like you can have K-A-T as in cat for Catherine. Or C A T Catherine and C A T animal meow cat right, but A B C is A B G, but G can be a soft sound like Genesis or a hard sound like Gnosko, and again all of this complicated. Wait a minute, why did all this happen? Right? Don't you ask that question? I always do when it gets crazy like that. I'm like, why did this have to happen this way? What the heck? Couldn't they have made it easier? Couldn't they have just made it one way and everything would have been correct? Well, yeah, they could have, I guess. Um, maybe not, though. Maybe God had it all correct and Satan has it all screwed up. And that's why it's screwed up because we're in the devil's world, not in heaven, in God's uh, heaven. So I'm going to leave it at that because that's a tangent and it gets wacky. It's already wacky enough. But what I want you to see is that we don't have that word gnosko and gnosis. We have another word. And um, for those who have a Greek text of any kind, which includes Leonard with his uh, interlinear, um, there is a word in our verse, in verse 21, not anywhere near related to the one we've been looking at. So I'm going to put again, uh, gnosis, and I'll transliterate, meaning I changed the letters from Greek letters to uh, Roman or Latin, you know, our English kind of alphabet. We're going to see that word, and then we're going to see another word that you don't know, Greek word, and I'm going to do the same thing, transliterate, and they both mean no, knowledge, 
but in this case, to know. Now, there's gnosis and oida. Oh, I should uh, put the accent on the I, oida. And then the other thing that I want to do with that is I want you to see <coughs> that this oida changes form so radically. Uh, oh, look, I just got a text from my friend who is in the U.S. right now, <laughs> who's usually contacting us right in the middle of a broadcast, right? Only usually from another part of the world. I'll leave it at that. Um, it's summertime, right? What does it say? Oh, very cool. Maybe I have to send. I'm sending a, a CD. I guess I'm going to send two copies. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me that. All right. Now, I'm going to show you a form of this word that you would not see or not recognize if you saw it because – let me see if I'm doing all this stuff right. I really have lots to do here to do it correctly. I'm putting in all these correct accent marks and it's always extra and it's always precarious because you can get things wrong all kinds of ways. For oida, I put in the diacritical marks on it so that you see it's oida, not oida. Okay, you'd have accents over the A. Now, here's our word eidos, which comes from oida. And this is in a different form. And we're gonna learn tonight that what it actually is, the complete information on that word, is it is a present active participle. That's why it changes from this oida to eidos. Okay, that's how you can tell it's um, the song began, not the song beginning. You know, the song beginning? Well, that doesn't make sense. The song uh, had begun. Okay, had begun. Begun is different than begin and is different than beginning and is different than began, right? And then there's other forms like will begin. There's no word for uh, beginning, beginning, begin -o. You know, there's no other way to say it will begin than put will in front of it. That's the way the word is written. Now, in this case, we have oida and Eidos. These are classical Greek words. So uh, I'm going to look at, um, let me see. In this lexicon, I want to see, I've never done this before, and so I'm doing it live. I'm going to look and see if Oida shows up here. If it doesn't, I won't be surprised. And the reason is this says, but interestingly, if it is in there, it's because it's the Greek English lexicon of the New Testament. Now, oida is in the New Testament, but if it does come up here, what'll be nice is for us to see that it's going to say that it is an Attic Greek word, meaning it's from, cla yeah, there it is. It's from classical Greek. And this is small enough writing that I better have my glasses on. Let me look at the entry and tell you what does it say. Okay. One way you can see right away um, that it's classical Greek is in the entry, it shows right there. Uh, let's see. Where is Oida? Ah, now it's in the middle of the screen. C-H-O-M, that's for Homer plus. So from Homer on, think about that. That's 8th century B.C. And look on the next part where it says the stem. It says, uh, really the perfect of the stem, E-I-D. And so it talks more. It's got all these different forms. And it shows pluperfects and all these different grammatical constructions. Now, remember the EID business. 
That's what we have right here. And what do we have? A present active participle. Now I'm going to talk about that. That word, um, ADOS, would be the best way to say it. Um, what we have is a present active participle of oida in the form eidos, and the present tense has what we call in Greek grammar strong linear action start. That means the action start part of the word is a German uh, composition because German word that means the action is strong linear action start, so sort of action. And... It, the active voice of this word here where we see it and it translates it knowing. See, knowing that even above what I say you will do. That's Paul. Who's knowing? Paul. So the active voice means that Paul performs the action of knowing something. And Paul is people smart. And so this word, he's using not only people smart, Greek smarts. He's using classical Greek. And the participle is a circumstantial participle, meaning to know, because I know that. Now, we have the next word uh, in the text is hoti. In English, you'll have uh, a word. It can mean because or, or that, as in uh, uh, a far demonstrative, uh, hoti, that. And the word after that, chi, means even. We're going to see. Um, so it says, because I know that now where it says, even it's using the word and, and is the word Kai, but, and can have different forms of meaning, different, um, different applications so that this one is called the ascensive use of Kai and ascensive as in ascending. It means even not just and. So it says, because I know that even, and we'll see how that translates. So Paul knows Philemon has learned and will do the problem-solving devices and pass this people test of accepting Onesimus back. The word hoti, many times it's a causal conjunction meaning because. And here it's with a verb of just, bleh, I can't say it, decendi which meaning a verb of knowing, um, it, it can be translated because I know. Okay, so the fact that Paul knows, and then we have the future active indicative, and this is called a predictive future of the verb poieo. It's where we get the word poem and poetry. It's a to-do. It's a work, right? A poem is a work. And uh, here on page 63, uh, this is Summers. I took pictures of all this, but I'm going to show you it right out of the book. Um, in right here, where it talks about the action, we're in a section on uh, future. Let's see, I guess I got to go over here. And changes in future stems. Remember how I was saying how words change, begin, began, begun, had begun, will begin. Beginning, okay, here, let's see what it says. The time of action in the, of the future tense is obvious, meaning, haha, it's going to happen in the future. The kind of action may be either, here's two different ways, a point or an ongoing thing, a line. So it can be punctiliar or linear. And it says the context will usually indicate which is intended. Usually it is punctiliar. In our case, it is not. It is linear. Um, it's something that will be an ongoing thing that uh, that Philemon will do. Uh, the most natural construction for indicating continuous action in future time is the periphrastic future, which will be studied later. So there is uh, a, and this one that we're using, the predictive future, which is also in John 14, 26. Uh, as an example, I have it written there. But um, the, there's also, and it's used in, in Luke 10.3, the imperative uh, may be expressed in the future. 
And it gives an example. You shall call his name John. And so it says, Kaleses. And that's that uh, imperative future. Um, and then it says, uh, Ta, Anoma, Auta, or Autu, Yoanin, actually, is Yohanin, uh, Yoanin. That's the name for John in Greek. So there's also something called the deliberative future. And it can be when it's a rhetorical question. You know, Lord, to whom shall we go? And it's like, well, there's nobody to go but you. Okay, and so it's got that example. But anyway, I wanted you to see some of this so that you could see that we could have had either a predictive, an imperative, or imperatival, or deliberative future. And you're going to see how it makes sense for it to be just the predictive future. So what does it say? Um, we have oida and hati, kai, and poyeo, and that's the word in the future here. And if you have a Greek text, the word is the last word in the verse, and it says poieses. And the S in the poieses, that internal sigma. Uh, by the way, here's a good example of internal and final sigmas. I wrote it that way before, and I told you what it was, but here it is now. Look, uh, on the last word, right, let me see if we get that in the middle, right there, there's an S in the middle that looks different than the S on the end. Internal and final sigmas. So always giving you the details of the Greek or Hebrew so that we can figure this stuff out and make sense of it, right? So uh, again, Paul knows Philemon has learned and will do the problem-solving devices. He'll use the PSDs, problems, bleh, I can't say it, problem-solving devices, and pass the people test. The people test is a test between himself, that's Philemon, and Onesimus, his runaway slave and criminal who stole from him, who's never going to be able to pay him back because he took a bunch of money or something, something very valuable, and he's not going to be able to pay it back. He's a slave. He's an employee. He's not a you know rich uh, CEO. Uh, he's working uh, minimum wage or something, you know. All right, so anyway... Um, on this word, poieo, where I mentioned like poetry, it's our word in, in Greek for to do. It's the future, and we just studied and saw that that's called a predictive future. Uh, and it's the active voice. What does that mean? Uh, in this case, when Paul says, I know that you will do even more than I say that you will do. Who's he talking to? Who's going to perform the action of the verb? It's Philemon. And it's in the indicative mood, which means it's a declarative, dogmatic statement of fact. Paul knows that Philemon's going to do this. So apparently, when you talk about faith, Paul believes that Philemon is going to pull this off. Okay, so then um, it continues. There's the... Preposition in the accusative, who pair, plus an accusative plural, a neuter plural, hos. Um, and actually, for those of you with a Greek text, it's the one that looks like an A with some accent marks and says what underneath it in English, you know, like what I will do or what is going to happen and all that kind of stuff. Okay. As in a, the way we would think of an, uh, interrogative pronoun so what it is is it's a pronoun and it's in the accusative plural it's a neuter accusative plural and and uh the who pair the preposition also in the accusative that equals a sense of or exceeding or surpassing remember who pair means hyper it's over it's above or over and it says, for the host, what, as in what you will do. You will do what I say. So that what is the things that or the things what I say, you know, that idea. And we have in there, right before the poieses, the word you will do. But remember I told you there's an internal sigma. That's, what, that's the sign of the future. 
is the internal sigma. Let me see if it says that somewhere here uh, near that page 62 where we just were in summers because this is basic Greek grammar, and that's why I accentuate it for you. Why not, right? Uh, future active and middle indicative. All right. In this chapter, lesson 15, you have future and middle, uh, future active and middle indicative. And it shows, see, I shall lead. It's all future. I shall become. And when you get to the discussion, it says the future, read that part. The future stem is obtained by adding a sigma. There's that S as in a, an internal sigma. Adding a sigma to the verb stem. For example, the stem of luo is lu. Add S and the future is loose. This is a primary tense, uh, a primary tense. Hence, the primary active and primary middle endings are used. And on and on and on. To say the student should study paragraph 49 of this lesson carefully before he learns this vocabulary. So, yeah, 49 meaning right here, showing the grammatical study, and it's showing luso, luces, luce. See my yellow highlighting on the S's? Lusomen, lusite, lusos, uh, lususi. How about that? Lus, lusi, lususi. So, um, that S is highlighted everywhere with my um, my little yellow highlighter. And just so that uh, I could memorize all that stuff back in the day, and that way when I'm reading the Greek text, if I see that in there on a verb and I know it, I, ah, there it is, the future, uh, that little enclitic, as we call it, a little piece that goes in there, it's been uh, – in the way we talk about prefix and suffix, there's also infix. So a sigma has been infixed. And this is the kind of junk, if you want to call it that, the stuff that you learn when you're trying to really learn how to be an exegete and do this stuff. See, there's two internal sigmas. And this one is telling us that it's a passive future. And... Oh my, when you get these my endings, they can be two kinds of endings. One of them can be, it's called a deponent middle ending, or another one can be a real middle. And if it's deponent, it's middle in form, but active in meaning. But if it's not deponent, then it's really middle in both form and meaning. How about that? Yeah, I like what, uh, here's the Leonard's comment. There sure is a lot to learn to understand Greek. And check this out, because this is really cool. Guess what? There sure is a lot to learn to understand English. See, we speak English. We know English. So we do a lot of this without even knowing what we're doing or say it without really breaking it down. Like, what's the difference between, uh, you know, uh, when you use a word that ends in I-N-G, like raining? or walking, and I always say, what's the difference between a participle and a gerund? And when you hear that, you say, ah, that's not my forte. Ask an English teacher, you know, <laughs> an English major. Somebody knows the difference between a gerund and a participle. Well, guess what? An exegete has to learn these things, but we're always learning more, and we're always forgetting stuff, and always having to recheck, and you saw me do that tonight. Where did I have that? Oh, yeah, on the board here where, you know, I have to double check my alphabet letters and stuff. You say, that's so basic. I go, yeah, I haven't checked it out in such a long time that I don't remember it. And uh, look, here's a comment. I'm never too good at English either. That's right. See, if you spell it correctly, you'd have T-O-O. -O. See, instead of two. It's not two, <laughs> the preposition. It's two as in... Uh, See, now I can't think of what uh, the T-O-O, -O, what kind of word that is. But there it is. See, we can't keep up with all this stuff. But you got to keep trying and keep learning. Here's another comment. That's like Joe Griffin talking about diagramming sentences. Boy, you've been listening to a lot of Joe. That's great. <laughs> Joe will be happy and I'm happy because Joe, um, he also has a problem with English. And that's what uh, Leonard is saying, uh, that Joe 
just was supposed to know what this is, diagramming sentences, but it was like way heavy. Well, guess what? I never learned it well either. And I should say, I never learned it well in school, but I eventually had to learn it better. And so I kept going to school longer until finally I got it. All right, we digress. On to the next thing. So uh, as we mentioned, these, uh, this whole phrase, oida, uh, hoti, kai, uh, and I'm saying it out of order. So let's go with the order. Um, e, uh, eidos, hoti, kai, huper, ha, lego, poiesis, poieses. Um, we, we still have to look at our, let's see, the last word, lego, which is second to last in the sentence. And it literally means I say, and it's literally in the I say or to say form. Oh, yes, this is too funny. All right, so uh, we had Leonard talk about Joe and and when you talk about Miss Lamb, I think it is Miss Lamb who was the English teacher. And I don't remember the names of the other kids that always knew the answers, but Joe didn't. So there you have it. Uh, I got to get Joe to watch this scope. He'll get a laugh out of it. And maybe um, also uh, Gary Watson, which those guys would watch. But anyway, uh, they're busy and we all are. So um, as I say, this whole phrase here that we're looking at, um, the verb lego is a present active indicative. The present is iterative. And that word means it's repeated action to iterate and reiterate, to repeat it and re-repeat, you know, it's kind of that kind of word. Um, so it's an iterative present and the active voice is Paul has performed this repetition. And so he has been teaching and saying, and so when here in the sentence, in verse 21, it says, translation, confident in your obedience. I'm writing to you knowing that you will do that word poieo, a poem uh, uh, to do a work, you will work even more than I say. Again, the ascensive use of Kai, even. Um, and then, so it's even more, huper, even above, exceeding or surpassing over, you know, uh, ho, we had the host, accusative plural, the neuter plural. Uh, and in the text, it's just an A, an alpha with a, a rough breather. And so it's ha. And uh, it literally says, Hoti kai huper ha lego poieses. There's your Greek. And what does that mean? Well, as I said, Paul performed the action of that verb of saying over and over and over again, or whatever he says and asks to request to do. The indicative mood, we have a present active indicative. The indicative mood is declarative. Again, it's a fact. Um, of, in this case, a fact of history. And as he wrote it, it was a fact in Paul's head. And he says, so whatever I say, whatever I maintain, whatever I declare, now we have some points. Let's do 14 little points on this. Point one, Paul's confidence is not in a person i.e. Philemon, but, in quotes, in the Bible doctrine in his soul. Big difference. Paul's confidence is in the Bible doctrine in Philemon's soul. Not so much in, Paul, in you know, necessarily in Philemon. Paul's confidence is not in a person, i.e. Philemon, but in the Bible doctrine in his soul. Point two. When a person has metabolized Bible doctrine in the soul, he has confidence in the application of that confidence in obedience, in that confidence in obedience to people problems, etc. at Al. You know, in other words, um, if a person has the doctrine in his soul, his or her soul, then we can, as having confidence in that doctrine, we know that everything's going to work out. In this case, Paul has confidence in Philemon's obedience. 
and he knows that Philemon will handle these problems in a great way. So that's awesome. Point three, Paul is confident in God, whom Philemon loves from maximum Bible doctrine in his soul and from the word of God, which is his number one priority. This is very interesting to think about these aspects in relation to the words in our verse, in our in this letter, in this epistle, you put it together this way, you're thinking about the deep structure, <coughs> excuse me, the root of the matter. Cheers. I might have my uh, little uh, bit of tonight. It's uh, Pellegrino with lime. I have Perrier too, but right now I'm in the Pellegrino mode. That was swigging down a chug-a-lug. I was thirsty, I guess. Good stuff. All right, so we saw point three. Paul is confident in God, whom Philemon loves for maximum Bible doctrine in the soul and from the word of God, his number one priority. Point four. Consequently, when such a person has love for God, and Bible doctrine as a number one priority, you have confidence in their decisions and judgments. That's a pretty good uh, blurb. Let me repeat that. Point four, consequently, when such a person has love for God and Bible doctrine as a number one priority, you have confidence in their decisions and judgments. Point five, maximum Bible doctrine in the stream of consciousness in Philemon's heart, make it possible for Philemon to obey and execute God's will. It's not even Paul's will. It's, it's God's will. And so they're all Paul, even Onesimus is a young believer who's apparently growing quickly and doing well. And Philemon, they're all seeing everything through the grace grid, through Bible doctrine and problem solving devices. So there's a lot to latch on to. And that's why uh, there's so much good stuff. Point six, the same Bible doctrine in Paul's heart um, for Philemon makes it possible for Paul to have confidence. So Paul has confidence in Philemon and he's able to express that to Philemon and, and express it. He's got confidence in Onesimus. And so he knows that all this is going to work out. Onesimus is going to make it. He's already making it or he wouldn't be going back to uh, Philemon. Point seven, Paul does not have confidence in people, but in the word of God, in the souls of people. Okay, so let's repeat that. Point seven, Paul does not have confidence in people. That's not where the emphasis is. But in God's word, in the souls of people. So now you can see that he's got, he's got thinking in regard to both Philemon and Onesimus. Point eight, note that people problems are solved by Bible doctrine in the soul. That is definitely an issue. Point nine, people problems are solved by God's solutions. So the problem solving devices, occupation with Christ and so on, these are the problem solving devices. Um, you know, you've got to have doctrine in your soul. Well, to start out, you gotta be a believer. Then you have doctrine in your soul then you've got to apply it. And as you grow spiritually, you have your spiritual self-esteem and you're going through you know, this whole chain of events, uh, each step, you know, you've got um, uh, doctrinal orientation and grace orientation and all these different things that help make it possible to make good decisions and to have confidence in whatever your situation may be. And remember, a lot of times we've got really horrible situations that we got to deal with. 
All right. Well, anyway, I digress. Keep going or we'll never get past all this. 10, point 10. This verse anticipates Philemon passing this people test. Point 11. Philemon will forgive and forget with regard to Onesimus. That is a key and big deal. Philemon will forgive and forget with regard to Onesimus. That is using the problem-solving devices. Point 12, the barriers will be removed and reconciliation will take place. So this is the good news. Point 13, Onesimus will return and serve under his rightful authority, who is Philemon. And 14, I'll repeat 13 again, Onesimus will return and serve under his rightful authority, who is, of course, Philemon. Point 14, Philemon and Onesimus uh, both pass this people test from the solutions in their souls. So um, that concludes the, the verse and our data, our thoughts with regard to verse 21. Now, I'm going to, let me see how much of this I can do. And let me see, let me go to my, uh, my shots here for a second. I want to see what, um, hmm. yeah, we're getting into the pictures that I took um, on the stuff I want you to catch that's extra. And what I'll do, I think I'll take a bunch of these. Let me see here. Put them on my desktop. And... Yeah, that'll work. And we will start to talk about this intercalation that I'm putting in, which, as I mentioned here, an interjection. I'm going to, to talk about verse 22, and I think the way we can do it, a cool thing to do right now, would be to start by reading verse 22. So if you have your text handy, at Philemon verse 22, it says this. This is the revised standard, the new revised standard version that is in our, if you have one of these, the Greek English interlinear. The translation in this uh, form would say, one thing more. <laughs> Big dash. Prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. Now, the word restored, and that I will be restored, is this big, long, compound word with lots of stuff going on in it. And so I want to reread that verse. Uh, one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. There's a lot packed into that verse. And we're now really starting to get to the end. There's, there's really no more doctrine involved. Uh, everything that we've been doing so far, we've been talking about Bible doctrine. We've been talking about attitudes about problem-solving devices. So how people apply the doctrine in their souls and are they, let's call it, being Christian, doing the Christian thing, doing the God thing, you know, doing the thing that God would want us to do because it's the right thing to do. We're leaving that aspect in this letter 
because the letter is basically, as far as that's concerned, the letter is done. The doctrine is hit. It's been, you know, uh, what's the other word? Been pronounced. So at this point, we're going to want to look at these words. And what I'm going to do right now is open up these passages. I want you to see a particular word here. I'm going to show you. Let me see if I can get this one up. Let's pull yeah, this big one right here. And let's make that as big as I can make it. Right now, that's all I can do. Uh, unless you're on a big screen, you can't really see where I want you to see in this picture. But um, there is on the right-hand side near the top, well, first of all, way up at the top, it says kara. And that word kara starts in the right column, like after the space. There's two lines and then a space. Kara, that word goes all the way over to the next page. And what it means, it eventually, uh, as you get a little ways down of all these, all this craziness, there's a Philemon verse 7 listed. And that's why I have this word, and I, I should have made a bigger copy of it. Let me see if I did. Let me look at the next one. Yeah, I've got for the next picture, so let's keep doodling with pictures here. I'll stop that. Um, I will get this second picture here. Which, by the way, I want to get rid of the first one, make it easy on me to figure out where I am. Uh, I'm learning how to do all this cool stuff as far as getting things in your hands or at your eyes anyway. All right, now you can see it blown up. There's the word kara. And if you go down, let me see, um, about where it says one, go down about five or six lines further down and over to the right and you'll see F or PHLM7, that's Philemon. Okay, so in verse seven, Paul used this kara word, and uh, let's see, where do we have to go to get where? Let's try to see the first time where it says joy, but it shows so much Greek. Oh, actually, right after at the top, kara, go to the second line, and at the right there, it says joy right before the number one, okay? And that's what Paul said in verse seven. Um, he mentioned that, and let me read that verse where he says it. He says, I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother, Okay, that's the whole verse seven. And this word kara, I want you to see that those first letters, ki, alpha, rho, and then another alpha. Those first three letters are the beginning of our word over here, that karistesomai. Okay, karistesomai. That kar is part of the kara. And so now, let me see if I can get all these things here. Hold on a sec. All right. Go to the next uh, page. And by the way, that last page in the text was page 875. And that's in, where is it? I've got so many books out. See if I can get where I can see this. All right. In this lexicon, it's page 875, right? 
Well, when we go to the next page, let me see if I still have that up. Yep. Let me pop this up for you. Takes a second. There we go. This page at the bottom there, 876, I now have another one for you. Let's go to eight. Let me see, which one is this? Oh, that's the wrong one. That's the one I just showed you. Ah, here we go. On the next page that I want to show you, we're on 876. And all oh, this stuff is a little bit slow, but I'm getting better at it. There you go. On 876, let me see if I can do this well. Yeah. Um, all right, so you have the R word. But as karizomai, if you can read that. And that karizomai, under number one there, it says, give freely or graciously as. And then it says, of God, you know, when God is doing it. Tini T, it says, some, uh, down a couple lines, something to someone. And then it gives more karizestai, uh, tini tain, uh, soterion. And that has to do with giving salvation, soterion. And karis, uh, let's see, what is this one? Karisastai, uh, moi, tende, ho, basileo, te, karin. Um, and uh, giving me the kingdom of, of grace. And it mentions uh, Romans 8, 32, Philippians 2, 9 and so on and so forth, okay? But the point is, notice it's all this giving and freely, graciously favor, all that good stuff. Well, this um, is where we're going to see the use of this word in this verse. Look at the bottom. Look at the second to bottom line. Actually, it's it kind of angled funny. So. If you look up there uh, in the middle of the, of the bottom of the page, there's some Greek. And then the next thing it says CF Philemon 22. Ta-da! That's where we are. Philemon 22. So for me, I see it as at the bottom of, you know, the that graphic. The one who is given escapes death or further imprisonment by being handed over to those who wish him freed. And that's talking about in uh, Acts 3.14. It says cross-reference Philemon 22. You have the same situation. Um, you've got Paul who is in prison and who's going to be hand over, handed over and executed. But the people praying for him want him to be free. Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't work out for Paul. And he does end up not coming. Now, also one last thing place you want to see it is it says uh in the first future sense kari says uh, look near the top of this page and it says the uh kari zomai uh notice that's the uh what we call uh the hold on a second gotta get the right word the gosh i can't think of the right word again to say in its original form uh I guess the right way to say it would be in its lexical form. Karizomai is a little different than the way we have it. If you look at the, the bottom line of that paragraph, that first paragraph, it says, first future, karistesomai. There it is. That's our form. It's in a future. And it says Philemon 22. See, so then you have letter or... Um, uh, first entry lexical form of the uh, definition to give freely or graciously as a favor. All right, so you're seeing what I want you to see out of this page. And so I can take that down and then go to uh, the next one that I want you to see. And, uh, and here's where I'm going to blow this puppy up so you can see it. Let me put it in share mode. And I have to push like five or six buttons before I can get it to work. 
All right, here we go. This is, and it's pretty big, so you can read it. Um, let's see where we want to start. In the middle section there, near where it says PHLM22, and that's the one, it says the one who is given escapes death or further imprisonment by being handed over to those who wish him freed. We saw that a minute ago, and I just blew it up for you so you could see it better. Um, we're going to see a little bit more on that. Let me get to one or two more blurbs, but see Philemon 22, it actually uh, uses our verse as an illustration. And so where is my, yeah, there we go. I'm going to block that out, get us back. And then I'm going to show you one last graphic. And let me pull that one up for you. And here we go. All right. In this one, um, let's see. Where did I want you to see? I guess the the main thing out of this little graphic, this page, is for you to see. I mean, there are a couple of things that can be noticed here, but where it says give equals remit, forgive, or pardon. And some of the translations will say that I will be given to you. And let me see what it says in ours. Um, it actually, in the new, let's see, in the new revised standard version, our verse ends with, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. And uh, there are other versions. Let me see. Let me double check with my uh, New American Standard version. It says, For I hope that through your prayers I shall be given to you. So there, the New Testament in the New American Standard version uses the word given. And you can see here under the second um, entry, it uses the word give and translates it as give. And this, again, all part of what I want to do with this exegesis, I want you to see different ways that things are, quote, interpreted and translated. So that's that. And I guess I can uh, go to our next point. Now, give and given, you know, restored, returned, whatever, all those different words. What was the other one? Yeah, restored to you. Um, I'm going to interject in this word, charis, which is a grace or a gift. And in this point, it's a passive future and uh, it passive would mean you're receiving. I, I think I'm going to stop here. And instead of starting the whole new section that I have now introduced, um, we have finished verse 21. We are in verse 22. In fact, that is the second to last word. It's basically saying, I will be restored and I will be restored, meaning I am not doing the restore. I'm not going to restore in the future. I am going to be restored. I'm receiving the action restored to you. The last word, whom in. Okay. So, very interesting here. We're going to see how it says uh, through your prayers to be restored to you. But we're going to see that restored has a total different context with regard to a, uh, a biblical view of something that we understand that I'm going to tell you right now, as of this year, it will be the 400th 
time the United States of America has done this. Okay, 400th exactly, not 399, not 401, but 400 times. How about that for sounding biblical? You know, like seven times seven is 49, and but the seven times 70 is 490, and there have been 483 years, and now we'll have the last seven years will be the time of trouble, Jacob's ladder and all this good stuff. Well, guess what? We're going to be looking at a bunch of points on a certain thing from a biblical view like you've never seen before and from the perspective of 400 times. So there. And I will rest my case when I finish that particular dissertation. Now, um, so tonight we finished verse 21. And we really haven't looked at verse 22, except for one word in it. And that's what we're going to be figuring out. We're going to be working on that. And that will be for next week. And as I say, we're getting close to ending this letter because the rest of it is salutary uh, business. And we won't have to spend a lot of time on that. We won't be spending much time having to do any exegesis of it. but. For those of you who did not catch the beginning, the you know this is a 25 verse letter, and if you didn't catch the first 20 verses or whatever, uh, sadly I can't you know um, pull up those early classes because they were done on Periscope. But the good news is, if you want to do this letter in an abbreviated form. For example, I think it's done the whole thing almost in 18 uh, classes. You can get that probably through either RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries or Baraka Church. And that way you could go through the whole, and I mean, there's a lot of fascinating stuff in the beginning. Um, Bobby Theme did it in, I think it was around, somewhere around 2003 or four or five. Um, I did it several times. And this is the first time I've done it in a you know public way of broadcast and so on. But I've been through it. I mean, the first time I went through it, the way we're doing now was about 30 years ago. And then I went through it in seminary. And then I went through it again with Bobby, like I say, about 15 years ago. And so we're getting close to the end. There'll be a few more things and it'll be at least a few, you know, another month. I keep saying another few weeks, another month or two. And it's always, you know, six months later, we're still here, but it will uh, come to a close and we'll eventually get to a new, uh, a, a new text. And I'm pretty sure that new text is going to be old Testament. So I've been looking at that. So we'll see what happens. But meanwhile, I guess what I'll do is we'll stop here because uh, it's a good spot to stop. We've been looking at the word uh, karistesomai. And I'm going to bring up my usual prayer board and mention, well, two things. On the other side of it, I have my current CD that's available, and there's a new one coming. But uh, I want to, again, announce that anybody who has had uh, – or has not had the chance to hear this music, it's available everywhere. Um, it's particularly on uh, YouTube, so that you can catch it that way. Let me see if I can do this right. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's also on all the music subscription services. Some of them you have to have a premium subscription, like I know on uh, Amazon, you won't get to hear my music on Amazon Prime. But if you get Amazon Unlimited, then, in fact, if you even put my name in there, it'll say, yeah, it's available, but you got to have Amazon Unlimited. So uh, there's my plug for the Home With You CD, and there's 12 songs on it. And uh, it was a very fun project. It turned out really, really great. I was um, impressed with the fact that it could turn out as well as it did. I'm surprised. 
because I did everything myself. And, you know, you kind of normally wish that you had all these great people do it for you. Well, turns out it turned out okay anyhow, so I'm happy. Now, our last uh, item on the agenda is prayer. And <clears throat> I, I want everybody to know how to pray because there is such a thing as praying incorrectly. So, and most people don't know that. They think, oh, if you just pray, God listens. Wrong. There's a way to pray. And the Bible explains it. And there are books such as the one that we covered here uh, a couple of years ago, probably as many as three years ago, at least two or three. This book was covered. And again, it all disappeared because it was on... Um, Periscope. And we went through this book word by word. And if you don't think that there's a lot of information there about how to pray, uh, then ask for that book. It is free of charge. So the first thing for prayer, rebound. Second, thanksgiving. Third, intercession, such as all these categories. And fourth and final thing is petition. My petition uh, is always pretty much the same. I mean, most of the time, and that is, uh, I want to do a good job preparing these um, exegetical broadcasts, and I need your prayer for that, that I can get things done and do them well so that they turn out right and glorify God, and I don't get in trouble for doing it, because uh, if I do the wrong thing, uh, it won't be fun for me. Uh, God doesn't appreciate that, and he lets you know. Uh, secondly, I am working on the new recording project. Appreciate your prayers in that regard that I can write well and then record well, you know, perform well, engineer and produce and ultimately master the project well and then get it up for distribution. All of the things involved in getting the other companies to prepare and release such a project as this, you know, a, a full blown CD with, uh, you know, all the, the goodies on it and the licensing and permissions and like that ID BLM with the licensed content, which I will have on this one as well. This was done in the end of 2017. So it's been a while, but, I plan on doing uh, and having even more fun with this project. And uh, I have fascinating people to work with on it already. And we've been uh, putting things together. I'm going to be calling it kind of a greatest hits that I played on, uh, uh, meaning others greatest hits as well as mine. <laughs> so uh, any comments, any questions, any Anything. In fact, if you want to make it more private, you can always go to Philippe at factsofmusic.com and email me. Or you can write snail mail. Um, and I never ask for anything. Um, your time is the most valuable thing. And I ask for that uh, reluctantly and respectfully and uh, with great appreciation that anybody would give me their time. And so I thank you now for that. And so for anybody who watched or will watch this broadcast, thank you. All right. So on that note, without any further comments, let's have closing prayer and we will resume on Monday night in our appendices, the appendix plural of this book, Mental Attitude Dynamics, and uh, I like the dog. I think that's sassy. Um, and that was the dog's name, I think. Um, so anyway, um, ah, and I got a uh, another nice thank you from Leonard, and uh, appreciate you, Leonard, and thank you for being here, and um, thanks for uh, your prayers, and ah. <laughs> And there it came right up too. Yeah, seriously, I am grateful. And as you can tell, 
I'm able to do okay and do well and have a good time. And I know that's not just because I'm blessed. I mean, that's obviously a part of it, but you know, cause God is definitely blessing me. And, but it's, this life is complicated. And so it's not always easy to, uh, to get through the day. Right. And so anyway, I hope that you will have a good few days here coming up this big, uh, we got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, the end of the week and the weekend bookends, <laughs> end of the week, weekend bookends. And, uh, and Monday night we will continue. So on that note, uh, let's close in prayer. Um, I am really a happy camper and appreciate having you there. So on that note, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your grace, for this time together, the things that we looked at, and the fact that you love us and you want us to be really happy and to enjoy all of these things that you have provided for us. And uh, we always ask all of this, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name, amen. So, salutations, and see you on Monday night, hopefully. Thanks again. Okay, see ya.